Nigeria's central bank governor, Godwin Emifile, has a lot to explain last Wednesday on what the government has approved to do with the creative industry across four cities in Nigeria, Lagos, Port Harcourt, uh, Kano, and Enugu, getting those folks who are youths and those who are young and those who are putting all their creative energies into fashion, uh, technology, or what's called ICT, as well as movies and music. And of course, the pilot is Lagos State, 22 billionaire is what sources told us over the weekend that the Buhari's administration has approved uh, to be put together via the Bankers Committee to get this creative industry pack built and get youths employed and engaged in a creative manner. So let's take a listen to uh, what this is all about and what, how this will be funded uh, via the Central Bank Chief Godwin Emefele. Take a listen. Using our agricultural small, medium and small, small and medium enterprise fund, through which the bank set aside on an annual basis 5% of their profit after taxes, our goal is to support startups and existing businesses in the creative industry space, as well as the development of a creative industry park across three major cities in Nigeria. With the kind support of President Muhammadu Buhari and the Lagos State Government, the National Arts Theatre Ikomu in Lagos is expected to serve as the initial pilot for the Creative Industries Park in Nigeria. Our plan is to develop a 40-acre Creative Industry Park around the National Arts Theatre, including giving the theatre itself tremendous facelift thereby reopening the tourism potential the National Theatre offered during the first act 77 as culture. I understand that National Arts Theatre can sit close to 30,000 people at a time. Those of you or those of us who grew up attending cinemas at that time in National Arts Theatre will imagine the kind of potential that 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 edifice presents. But today, the National Art Theatre has become a relic. But with the kind approval of President Muhammadu Buhari, National Art Theatre has been, has been handed over to the Bankers Committee and the Central Bank of Nigeria to redevelop it. And in addition to that, the Lagos State Government, Governor, Mr. Jide Shawolu has also allocated a 40-acre land around the National Arts Theatre for the development of a creative industry hub first in Lagos. The site will be taken over on Wednesday by the chairman of the Body of Bank CEOs, Mr. Herbert Wigwan, and I'm sure he's going to have an opportunity addressing this morning. Following the development of those pilot scheme in Lagos, we intend to set up similar parks in Kano, Port Harcourt, or Enugu, depending on who invites us first between the two, either Port Harcourt or Enugu. I hope those in Port Harcourt and Enugu can begin to market the bankers' committee. Our goal through the establishment of these parks is to create an environment where startups and existing businesses can be incubated and rewarded for, creative, for their creativity. In each of these parks, efforts will be focused on discovering the most innovative young entrepreneurs across music, movie, fashion, and IT industries. Each park will be able to support skills acquisition for over 200,000 youths. These individuals will be empowered with funds at single-digit interest rate, state-of-the-art tools, high-level training and networks that will enable them to turn their ideas into reality. When they are able to achieve this objective of creating a new music product, a high-quality movie, an IT software application, or a fashionable outfit, we will work to ensure that they are able to distribute their work on a large scale around the globe. 
We are cognizant of the fact that a growing creative industry will also support the growth of other sectors of our economy, such as logistic firms, financial service companies, construction firms, as well as legal firms. So far, the CBN and the Bankers Committee intend to support this creative venture with 22 billion naira of initial funds. Part of our efforts in the music and movie industry would be to support young entrepreneurs in the development of digital content at the park. Our creative industry financing initiative will also enable the development of in distribution of outlets such as cinemas and music platforms, which will help improve the reach of the content developed by our young entrepreneurs. We intend to support the development of over 50 additional cinemas. The cost structures of these cinemas will be lean in order to make movies affordable to a large section of Nigerians. But I say within this 22 billion, it's not just about building the, the IT hub, I mean the creative hub, that young people, whether in the movie, whether you are in the movie, in the music, you are in the IT, software development, or you are in the fashion industry, should be able to access funding from your bank. And if you see in this room, at least close to a third of this room, you have the chief executives of the banks in Nigeria. They are today hungry for your business because they have come to realization themselves that we need to support the youths. They have come to realization that, and we have ourselves developed structures to ensure that when you take a loan, you must pay. And that is the advice that I have for the youth, for anybody who wants to borrow money. I keep saying that the bankers are the easiest people to deceive. But at the same time, they could be the most difficult when they see some of, the, some of those traits of a bad character in you. So when you take a loan, you pay. Indeed, we have gone ahead by ourselves to say that when you take a loan, all banks will now have in their offer letters and loan agreement the clause that says that by me signing this offer, offer letter or loan agreement, that I warrant that I will pay my loan. But that if for one reason or the other, I do not pay my loan, I abandon bank A and go to bank B. And my name gets reported to Central Bank of Nigeria's credit risk management system, the database, that the Central Bank, using any instrument, instrument available to it, can scan the banking industry and wherever I have money, they will take my money and pay off my loan. That would help to, that would help to, uh, to it's helping to increase the confidence that the bankers can have in now lending money to you. But at the same time, it also says that don't go for a loan if you don't want to pay. Go, for a, go to take a loan from your bank, and I can tell you the banks are willing today to grant you facilities because they are hungry, that we have a shared responsibility to see the development of the entrepreneurial skills in our youth, which like we said today, people of the age of 30 and below currently, by demography, control close to 60% of our population and there's an important need at this time for us to give support to this sector of our population strata. Because if we do not, we all know the danger that portends for us. These measures, which will be implemented over a five-year period, will increase the contribution of our music industry, movie industry to GDP from 1% to 3%. It will also result in improved revenues generation of over $300 million from production and distribution of Nigerian movie at cinema locations at home and abroad, as well as the creation of over 200,000 direct and indirect jobs. In the area of music production and distribution, this initiative over the next five years will enable young Nigerians to capture significant market share of the $10.7 billion music industry globally. It will also create over 500,000 direct and indirect jobs in Nigeria. Uh, so moving just beyond those very lengthy speeches on Wednesday, 
uh, the central bank governor and the governor of Lagos State, among others, got together on Saturday afternoon to get to inspect the National Theatre Facility and to talk more about how this works. According to sources on Saturday, this work will start uh, by December, that is getting the grounds around the National Theatre to start work with the Bankers Committee Money 22 billion with the Lagos flagging it off. Let's take a listen to what the Lagos State Governor Bajide Sanwolu and uh, the Central Bank Governor uh, uh, of the Central Bank provided us update on Saturday afternoon. What we have come to ascertain for ourselves is to, is to also appreciate the extent of um, an asset that has been conceived um, as a non-earning asset. But uh, I dare say that Mr. President has been very gracious, you know, to give the go-ahead and turn this um, dead asset into what will turn income to earning. an income earning a state of art developed um, entertainment industry, fashion entertainment industry. What we've gone around to ascertain for ourselves is um, a uh, piece of land measuring nests of about 30 hectares or so, which currently, um, as you can see for yourself, um, is, is all swamp, is all grown weed in the heart of Lagos. And so what we've come to see is for us to be able to give the go-ahead, working with all of the other stakeholders, right, um, to be able to give the go-ahead for our... Uh, Developmental partners. Um, at this this time is the is led by no other person than the governor of the central bank himself, who are putting um, investments together um, to be able to do um, a first of its type um, entertainment, fashion, um, music, music um, technology, culture, IT. technology, IT, anything, and and anything you know, hub, you know, all around this place. And you can see that infrastructure is available. We all walked past, we saw the Gomu um, rail station that is also um, currently ongoing. Um, you, you saw the edifice. So what, what we have gone around is to see how can we make this place a destination for the future, a tourism destination for the future, an entertainment destination for the future, a technology destination for the future where the teeming youth of Nigeria can come and exhibit all of their God-given skills and talent and even be able to bring up new ones and turn it to a hope that all of us as Nigerians will be truly, really um, proud of. Um, I'm, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm happy that um, um, the kind of things we've seen here, you know, today, just so that we can start the entire regeneration of this whole area. And um, that's where... We're here for, and 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 um, if 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 we have the chance to also touch the National Heart Theatre whilst doing that, so be it. But the, the the first part of call is to redevelop all of the you know land surrounding this whole place. If you all recall, the National Art Theatre is a national asset, which hosted this asset hosted the entire world during the Festival of Arts and Culture in 1977. This asset can host nothing less than 30,000 30, people sitting, whether on a music or in a movie, or in a fashion, or even, I mean, we call it international convention center. Same international seminars can hold in this place. I have been at certain uh, different other countries where, uh, for instance, the IMF World Bank meetings holds uh, once in three years outside Washington. Uh, three years ago, we were at Peru, and I can tell you that if this asset is developed, this asset will more than 10 times surpass the kind of, the kind of convention center that we saw in Peru. And that's the reason we felt, listen, that the youth need a chance. They need, we need to give the youth of this country a chance. And that's why under our creative industry uh, financing initiative, we felt, look, for those who are, want to do fashion, those who are into movie, those who are into the IT, and also do, are also into the entertainment and music industries, we will build a hub around this national art theater edifice to accommodate them so they can develop their God-given gifts.
Uh, talking about uh, creative industry, uh, starting with uh, Lagos. Uh, so let's uh, uh, move this from Lagos to London. It was a very busy weekend for the UK Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson, but it's going to be a little more tougher for him this week as the deadline uh, continues to a major EU summit in about a week from now. And, of course, the deadline for the Brexit to happen on the 31st of October. Let's get a sense of where we are uh, as far as the Brexit uh, a conversation is all about. Uh, Juliana Lyonka, my colleague from our London studios, uh, is uh, live to us uh, on this conversation for a couple of minutes. Juliana, I hope you had a very great weekend. I had a great weekend, uh, Boson. Yes, and hope you have kept one permanent eye on the political discourse around Brexit. I'm sure you wouldn't miss that on the local TV channels around the UK. Well, you can't avoid uh, Brexit at the moment, even if you wanted to. And as you said, you know, the time is running out. And it kind of feels as if we're living in a parallel universe at the moment. On one hand, Boris Johnson, as he did yesterday when he was urging EU leader, leaders to try and give him some concession when it comes to the deal, he said yesterday, and he's been repeating it, that he will be leaving on the 31st of October with or without a deal. On the other hand, we know that considering we've got this Ben law, it would be illegal for Boris Johnson to leave on that date without a deal. And uh, MPs and the government in particular are saying that he won't be doing that. So we're a little bit confused at the moment. What we do know is that on Friday, uh, Boris Johnson's Brexit negotiator, he was with the EU Commission. And uh, the EU Commission said that uh, the withdrawal agreement doesn't go far enough, uh, that he'll need to take it back um, and redo it and relook at some of the main issues, of course, one of them being the border between the north and the south of Ireland. Now, there are some suggestions that Boris Johnson may try and swing and go back to the drawing board and move uh, some things around with that. But time is running out. Uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, he was speaking publicly yesterday and he also confirmed that EU leaders are not happy with the deal, but a decision will be made on Friday. We do have uh, the Brexit negotiator, David Frost, in Brussels later today. So hopefully we'll be hearing more and more feedback. But yes, uh, time is running out and deal or no deal is really the question uh, everybody in London is uttering. Yes, uh, Juliana, it's called the hourglass. You know how it is uh, with the sand inside it. And it's beginning to trickle out little by little until it becomes empty. Uh, it's just that, unfortunately, I'm not sure if uh, PM Johnson will be able to turn the hourglass the other way around and it start flowing because once it drones out this time around, there is no coming back. Looks like a point of no return. But it's still a long way off. Let's see how it all pieces out. But, so let's get on to look at the corporate news. What's the latest about this uh, trial of some former Buckley's uh, staffers fraud trial? Well, this is a highly anticipated trial. It's pretty unprecedented because we know bankers have been in trouble plenty of times before, but it's rarely ever a criminal matter. And this uh, trial will be taking place at the Old Bailey today. It involves three uh, former chief executives at Barclays Bank, and it goes back to over a decade in the height of the financial crisis, particularly the one that was happening in London. And these uh, former bankers are accused of uh, colluding with uh, some wealthy investors from Qatar to basically get some illegal alleged cash injections. And basically what these cash injections done is it made uh, Barclays one of the very few banks to survive uh, the financial crisis without getting a bailout uh, from the government. So there are three of them in court today, one of them being Roger Jenkins. He was the former investment uh, head of banking. Thomas Kolaris, the wealth management chief, and Richard Both, he was the head of Europe's uh, financial institutions. All three of them denied the charges, but all three of them will be uh, facing the judge and jury today at the Old Bailey. So pretty unprecedented. A lot of people are going to be keeping a close eye on that case. Yes, I'm sure you're keeping an eye on that for us as well. Bankers are always get in trouble with other people's money and, and what have you. But as a conversation fan of the day. Uh, so what's the uh, current uh, trading week going to look like for the London market? Is Brexit and the US tra uh, China trade talk and all of that get the markets to, to squeeze into their political, geopolitical trade war, impeachment inquiry in Washington? What does it look like for the UK market getting the week started? Well, interesting. Last week, Boson, everybody was talking about the data. But as you said this week, everyone's talking about Brexit and the US-China trade talks, which will resume 
on Thursday. Now, of course, you know, the U.S. China trade tariff is sending shivers down every global market at the moment. But there isn't much optimism because optimism in the past um, hasn't done the traders uh, very well. But they are keeping a close eye. This morning, the FTSE opened just a fraction higher, one point higher. And at the moment, sterling is trading 0.06 percent above the dollar at about one dollar twenty three. So lots of people are focusing on that. Also, as well, there were reports over the weekend that HSBC may be cutting up to 10 thousand jobs. So their shares this morning were down 0.07 percent. And everybody in the city is looking at that. Also, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, he'll be giving a speech later today. So it seems that a lot of focus is across the Atlantic. But uh, we'll give you a better update at intraday. Yes, uh, thousands of kilometers away here in Lagos. We're also keeping an eye on uh, the city of London, Brexit and everything. There. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana. Uh, get ready for our afternoon crossover uh, with uh, uh, OABC Adebayo uh, for our Business Incorporated past lunchtime. Thank you so much. It's nice to have you. Okay, to all our viewers, we'll take about a minute's break. Let's be back with you after that.